Okay, um, welcome everyone. Welcome back. Uh, this uh, uh, monthly get together is uh, somewhere between a, a course and uh, a book club. And uh, the idea is to introduce you to the sky, the stars, the planets, much as if we were sitting around a campfire looking up or as originally planned at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Planetarium. Uh, we do a little bit of talking and then step outside and point at the real sky and do something practical. Until then, we're zooming. So hopefully it's only another uh, three or, or four months uh, before we, uh, we get to it. So maybe, maybe by spring. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, the idea of introduction to stargazing, it's all about looking, what you can see with your eyes. No telescope is required. Binoculars are great if you have them. If you have any questions about binoculars, by all means, uh, please uh, ask. Uh, we will not be covering black holes or dark matter, dark energy, or any of that kind of fancy stuff. We've got some great speakers who come to our uh, monthly meetings uh, of uh, the uh, RASC and who, who do talk about those things. So. I'm sure you'll, you'll join us then. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, uh, for us, I need to uh, keep emphasizing, um, make sure that you try and step outside on every clear evening that you have and just look up in the sky and, and refresh in your mind what the names of the brightest stars are and the brightest uh, constellations. And, and that's how you sort of slowly remember uh, it. Uh, if it's uh, at all like me with people's names, you say your name once and it's gone, but say it five times and I've got a reasonable chance of remembering. And so we're also got some uh, great uh, planet action out there. So to actually remember what the planets look like uh, at uh, each time uh, you uh, head out there. So we've uh, tried to design these sessions so that you can enter the loop at any time and uh, without being overwhelmed or feeling you need to catch up. And uh, the idea is that over the course of about a year or so, you should be able to earn the certificate and pin Explore the Universe from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, so please download and print off the PDF and um, I can hold it up at one point. It's just a standard PDF with some uh, information in it and uh, uh, it lists the various things you need to do to earn your certificate. So uh, not a little too uh, cloudy uh, for tonight, but oh well. Um, the, the key publications and links are on the web page that are associated with uh, the series. So uh, please uh, interrupt me uh, or uh, Berta when you hear a word that you don't understand or a star name you're not familiar with. Um, I try and remember uh, and uh, hit myself that uh, there's a, back when I started, I didn't know anything either. Uh, so we're, we're all sort of starting at uh, ground zero here. Okay, and comets is uh, nice timing is going to be one of the things we'll be talking about because we've got a nice comet coming up in, um, in a, almost a couple of weeks, three weeks time. So with that, let's shift over to our uh, presentation here. And welcome to winter or the start of the start of winter, uh, pre winter, uh, as uh, I like to call it. Uh, November uh, is typically the cloudiest month of the year in Alberta. We were just chatting uh, as so we we're starting up here with all the open lakes and rivers, all that moisture is going up into the sky. The cold air comes down from the Arctic. You put those two together and you get clouds. So until stuff, especially to our north and west, freezes over, once that freezes over, boom, we get the nice, clear, sunny winter sky uh, that uh, we're, most of us are familiar with. Um, so uh, 
Uh, here we go. Uh, this evening uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, the early winter sky, uh, a bit about the moon, constellation of Auriga, and uh, we'll talk about meteor showers, the Geminids coming up, and um, Comet. Uh, to start with, as uh, we always do, talk a little bit about uh, satellites, what uh, the things that move most frequently in the uh, evening sky are things that move high up are typically satellites. They're uh, as bright as the brightest stars and uh, just move slowly with the speed of what appears to be a high flying aircraft. So typically it will be the International Space Station. And the website Heavens Above has a list of all the what we call passes uh, as every 90 minutes or so. Uh, the International Space Station loops around the Earth and we get a, a second look at it. Um, and, but uh, the, the, um, the orbit, um, as the Earth spins underneath the orbit of the satellite, it moves in and out of being visible in the evening to not. So we've got some great evening passes right through to uh, the first week in uh, December. And uh, they're all around uh, supper time, plus or minus, just as the sky uh, darkens uh, after sunset. And you just click on one of these uh, highlighted um, dates and you'll get a chart. Just make sure that when you uh, click on Heavens Above that you make sure you uh, have Edmonton as your location and not the equator somewhere. Because the passes are totally different. So here we are, looking uh, south uh, at uh, uh, not quite mid-evening, but uh, uh, a couple of hours after sunset. And uh, this is our evening sky. South is to the bottom of the chart. So if you print out the chart that's uh, linked to you on the website, uh, this is what you'll see. Uh, and put S for south at the bottom. Overhead is the middle of the chart. So off to the southwest, which would be to our right, we have the uh, blazing Jupiter and Saturn. And already set by uh, 8 p.m. is the brilliant Venus in uh, the uh, southwest. Venus looks like a plane that's coming into land, and it's just it just never lands. Uh, but uh, higher up, twinkling, uh, the blue. Uh, Altair and the blue uh, Vega and Deneb, and this is the summer triangle. So the summer triangle is still hanging on in late autumn, but uh, they are setting. And what we'll be talking about is if you rotate the chart so that the E is at the bottom, uh, then we will be looking east. So overhead is still up, but if we're facing east. Put the E at the bottom, and here we have the bright stars of winter that are uh, beginning to arise. Uh, the uh, brightest one is Capella, and then we have the, uh, and it's a nice yellowish star. Aldebaran is the red eye of the bowl, although it's, I always see it as a light rusty orange. Uh, but, of course, uh, mythology likes to emphasize and saturate things, so it's the red eye of the angry bull. Uh, but we'll be uh, looking, at, uh, focusing here on uh, the constellation of Origa, and then tucked down low, Castor and Pollux with Gemini, the twins, and just rising is the constellation of Orion with its uh, bright red star. Beetlejuice. So, Auriga, uh, for the uh, typical person, Auriga is just a five star box or a pentagon. Maybe the, uh, if you're in a car, automobile, the state of mind, it's the Chrysler emblem, but uh, that's just a coincidence. Um, but uh, just off to the right, there's Aldebaran. Uh, of uh, the um, Taurus, the little V constellation here, or asterism here, is 
actually a star cluster called the Hyades, and above them are the famous seven sisters, the Pleiades, which some people mistake as uh, the Little Dipper. It is a dipper, it is little, but it is not the Little Dipper. But we're here concentrating on this pentagon of Origa, and this star Elnath is shared with Taurus. Here are the, if you think of a bowl with straight horns that go up, these are the horns here and here, and this is the face of the bowl. But we're going to be looking at Capella. Capella is the sixth brightest star in the entire sky visible to us, so no matter where you are in the world, Capella ranks number six. It's relatively close to us, 43 light years away. It has uh, twice the mass of our sun. Um, in uh, er every uh, culture out there has uh, a legend associated uh, with Capella, uh, the uh, Hindi, it's the heart of Brahma, and one of the many indigenous North American ones uh, for the Pawnee uh, have it as one of the four direction stars. So um, Antares in summer would be the reddish one, uh, essentially highlighting south, and that would be the red star of the uh, four direction stars. And then this magnificent triangle, thin, tall triangle of stars that are called the kids. In, in binoculars, the stars do, these guys uh, definitely show a uh, color difference, so uh, give those a look. And then there's this funny ghost disc here, and that is a, what is called a uh, internal lens reflection. Uh, that uh, mars many photographs. Uh, sometimes uh, if the professional astronomers are relatively inexperienced, they might think they've got some new object that's not cataloged, and it's any time you're within a uh, close range of a super bright star, you get a reflection of it uh, in, uh, in the image. So whether it's Mars or Jupiter, you've got to be careful. These uh, uh, surprise reflection nebula are often just a reflection of the star and not something new. Uh, one of the neat um, uh, cultural uh, descriptions, here's Capella again, here's the pentagon of, of Origa, uh, and uh, you just see these two sets pairs of stars and the Inuit called that Guturjuk, the collarbones, and they used it as a, a time reference. So whenever it started to set in uh, February, late winter, uh, they knew that the uh, dawn was about to break, and so that's the hunting time you can see. And so it's the as soon as they start to set, oh it's time to get ready and get out there. A neat uh, little uh, reference there as to uh, how important the stars are to hunting. Now the Europeans in their fanciful mythological minds uh, see a, a charioteer with reins off to one side and carrying goats. Um, okay, good luck picturing that. Uh, Perseus is off to the right here, but uh, back in the 1500s, uh, this is the mythological drawing that gets there. So Capella is the bright star here. And now you can see why these, this little triangle of stars is called the kids, because they were the baby goats uh, associated with uh, the charioteer Origa. And we're over to Berta. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alistair. Um, this time uh, of the year is a beautiful time of the year to look at the sky. The little bit later in January and February when Orion rises is going to be spectacular. But I also like to look in at uh, Perseus and um, Andromeda. So 
uh, keep in mind what Alistair has see, uh, explained to you and go out because the, the constellations at, the time, at this time of the year are actually really pretty too. Um, and so we are following in our presentation, Alistair and I follow what is um, <clears throat> in the RASC Explore the Universe Certificate Program. So the, the first items on the list are constellations. So uh, Alistair has <clears throat> explained how to find the constellations <clears throat> of this season, which are Pegasus, Andromeda, Cassiopeia, Perseus, Aries. We talked about it last, last month. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to continue with the items. And so the next items in the list are the moon. Um, so this month, <clears throat> we are going to focus, we are going to focus on the Mari Frigioris, which is this beautiful um, darker area that you can see stretching all across the top of the moon. That's what's Mari Frigioris. So you actually can see it over several days during the cycle of the moon, but the, around the 11th, 10th, 9th day are actually good times to, to see um, this beautiful Maria. Mare. Um, so Mare Frigioris is 1,450 kilometers long in a stretch from east, from east to west in the moon. And the width of the Mare is, is variable, as you can see. Sometimes it's really wide as, and sometimes it's a little bit narrower. And this is the northernmost basin that we can see in the moon. And it's also near the crater Plato, which is one uh, easy one to see because actually it's kind of dark and we are gonna talk about it later. And as I mentioned, it's best observed around the 11th day in the moon cycle. And we count, just to remind people, we count the days from new moon. So after new moon, then we have day one, day two, first quarter happens around day seven. So this is a little bit past first quarter. Uh, in the moon, but before full moon. That's the best time to, to observe this Maria, which is where, when the terminator uh, is the area between the day and night, the, the area that separates day and night in the moon, that's the terminator, uh, falls on top of that Maria. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And so actually you can see in here in this slide very well, this is the terminator. Um, Alistair is pointing it to you. That's the area that separates the day side of the moon to the night side of the moon. And when you wanna observe, when you want to observe um, feature in the moon, it's always more uh, easier to see or more well-defined um, when it's close to the terminator. Um, that's why we say that the best time to look at this, uh, this mare, it's around 11th day, which is more or less, um, the, this is what I'm showing now in the morning here, it's the 10th day moon. Um, so you can see how the mare, you could see half of it. Um, but anyway, moving on in the list of objects to see, um, now I'm going to feature the crater Plato. Uh, can you please go to the previous slide still? Oh, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't. So this is, uh, we mentioned it before, it's an outstanding, outstanding crater that is easy to spot due to its dark floor. So with binoculars, you can see it very clearly because it's also between two Mari. So it, it's gonna be easy to see at the top of the moon. And it's best view when the moon is around nine to 10 days old. Now the image that I included in this slide is how the moon is gonna look approximately on December 13th. So around December 12th, December 13th, if you happen to be able to see the moon, it will be a little bit past first quarter. So you could see it crossing the meridian. So more or less in the middle due south, I will say around uh, maybe seven, eight, nine in the night. Um, so, so you could see it at that time. Um, that's where the moon will be up view south um, to look for Plato. Plato. Okay, now can you please go to the next slide? And uh, this is an image of that crater. 
taken by the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. So you can see that it's actually, it has nice terrace walls and it actually has very few craters inside. So the, the surface of this crater is very nice and homogeneous and flat. Um, so that's an interesting feature about it. Thank you. And can you go to the next slide? Okay, and now moving on along in the Explore the Universe program, um, we have planets and other objects, which uh, Alistair has mentioned. Well, uh, this month, uh, Alistair mentioned that we have Venus is disappearing, uh, but we still can see Jupiter and Saturn due south, southwest, kind of after sunset. Um, so you could go and look at those. But if we move on, then we have deep sky objects that uh, are in the, in the certificate. So today we are gonna feature in the autumn um, part of the, of the Explore the Universe, um, we have the double cluster, which is one of, uh, it's a very beautiful theme to see with binoculars. It's a little bit beautiful object in the sky. It's close to the constellation Perseus, so you have to look east, kind of, uh, towards east to see it. Um, and it will be probably pretty much halfway between the horizon and the zenith, uh, looking east. Um, it's uh, two open clusters that are very close together. So you can totally see them with your binoculars at the same time. They're gonna look like fuzzy patches in, this, in, a, in a otherwise clear, like black sky. Um, <clears throat> and these are two open clusters. So if you scan the Milky Way between Cassiopeia and Perseus, these two beauties will be hard to miss that Alistair is pointing the path. So that's Cassiopeia on the top and that's Perseus at the bottom. And in between there is these uh, two beautiful clusters. Um, without binoculars, you probably see a misty patch that betrays the presence of one of the Northern skies grandest sites. I cannot see them by eye from the city, but uh, from Edmonton, uh, maybe other people got uh, my eyes are not that great. I cannot see them by eye, but I can see them with binoculars. And I've seen them by eye in a, from a dark sky just along the Milky Way. So they are really beautiful to see these two clusters. And if you happen to have a telescope and you can see them through the telescope, they are pretty beautiful. Uh, next slide, please. This is a picture that Alistair took. Um, and so you can see the two, two clusters that, uh, down there. There's two bright fuzzy patches. Um, and that's the, the kind of green stars are Cassiopeia, if I'm correct. Yeah. W of Cassiopeia. W of Cassiopeia. So and so start at the middle one, go to the lower left, and you just keep going about one and a half times and bang. With binoculars. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what you can see. Um, obviously, this is a beautiful picture. You don't see that many stars in the city. But um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. And this is just a little bit close up picture of that I took from the internet. Um, this is, again, even if you look at it with binoculars, you don't see that many stars from the city, but, but that's what you will see in the clusters. You wouldn't see as many stars around, but you could see those two clusters together um, with a telescope. You can make out the individual stars. All right, thank you. Can we go to the next slide? And so uh, moving on with the certificate, now we are gonna talk about double stars. And so we are gonna go to Cepheus, which is this constellation that is actually really high up in the sky, a uh, little bit past or around the zenith. So you really have to look up um, again, so was the east. Uh, if again, we have Cassiopeia there for reference. So if you find Cassiopeia, then you look in the opposite direction to Perseus, um, and then you will find Cepheus. <clears throat> um, 
So this, this double star that we are gonna talk today is Delta Cephe, is this star over there, which is composed of a variable star that is actually very famous and um, together with a little star beside it. And so those two stars, the companion star to Delta Cephe is believed to be physically related to the variable. And this variable uh, star is something that you can actually see. That means <clears throat> when we say that a star is a variable, it means that the magnitude changes over time. And Delta Cephe has a period of around five days, I think I read. Um, so you can see, get it brighter and dimmer over the period of five days, around five days. Um, and that's why it's represented in the image with uh, two dots. The bigger one represents the bigger, the magnitude when it's at brightest, and the smaller one represents the magnitude when it's at dimmest. And um, I think that's all today for me, Alistair. Okay. Oh, you, a yes, we got a, yes, we got a picture. So, so that's the star. Unfortunately, we cannot see, this is zoom out enough that we cannot see its companion, but nevertheless, that's how that star, again, you wouldn't see this from the city. You wouldn't see that many stars. You couldn't even make out the Milky Way, um, but um, you could certainly see this with binoculars. Yeah, thank you, um, If I can. Yes. Thank, thank you, Berta. Uh, if I can add here, yeah, Polaris is at the top here. So that's uh, uh, a nice anchor. Uh, Cassiopeia just off uh, to the left. So this is the end of the W on the left. And I always see um, Cepheus as the way um, you know, a four-year-old would draw a house with a you know, box here and then a pointy roof. And it's um, every now and then you, you might think, oh, wait a minute, is this the bottom and that's the roof? And, and it's just the top of the, the roof of the house is the one that's closest to Polaris. And that's how I anchor it. And then the rest of the constellation kind of falls in place. Off to the right, there's this nice hockey stick. And then there's the triangle of stars that includes Delta Cephe right at the um, at the uh, point of it. And uh, in binoculars, once you get used to this sort of, okay, Polaris, hockey stick, Cassiopeia, nice triangle, and, and then you can see Delta now for, for the rest of your life. And you can just compare it to uh, these two stars. At its brightest, it's as bright as this one, and at its faintest, it's about uh, the one in the lower corner and it's uh, yeah dead easy to follow in in binoculars so uh, give that a try and, it, and as Berta said it does a whole cycle in five nights so just about any night that you go out and look it'll be different and you'll be able to go oh yeah it's on the faint side or oh yeah it's at its brightest okay moving on we uh, hit the topic of meteors because we're coming into the best meteor shower of the year. I don't care what people say about the Perseids. Uh, it's a summer time. The Perseids are in mid-August, peaking August 12th, typically. So therefore, it's the best because it's summer. But uh, I, uh, I heartily disagree uh, that the, the Geminids are better. They are a stronger shower. They have brighter meteors. It's just colder. So as long as you dress for it, hey, uh, the, the Geminids are by far uh, better. There's another advantage of the Geminids is that uh, by mid-evening, if you go outside, they're already active, whereas the Perseids, you typically have to wait till after midnight. Um, but one of the things you'll be seeing over the next few days are, you know, the Geminids are coming and they, they will light up the skies. And, and of course, uh, that's uh, clickbait and uh, hyperbole uh, of, uh, of the media. And you never will see anything like this until 2033, 
when the uh, Fleming meteor storm hits us. Then you will see something like this. Uh, but until then, uh, no, uh, this is uh, a, a complete gathering of five hours of meteors all compressed into uh, one image. Um, and with, with a reasonable amount of luck, and as long as you're outside the city, uh, you should see meteors about as bright as this. So like, like you can compare, this is an older image where Jupiter uh, is the bright object here. But uh, uh, Betelgeuse, Procyon, um, and uh, the, the uh, Capella is just outside of the frame um, at the top here. Uh, but uh, the the brightest, as you can see, the brightest meteors are about the same brightest brightness as the brightest stars, um, and uh, so uh, from a, uh, uh, from a slightly outside of the city, a you know, thirty to forty five minute drive out, uh, we're hoping to see uh, about uh, one every two minutes, five every ten minutes, sort of thing. So. Uh, Let's see. Oh, I think I have to actually click on this. <laughs> Here we go. It's taking a little bit of time. So this is uh, one of the newer animations of what a meteor stream looks like. And so we're looking sort of down onto the uh, relatively flat uh, disk of the solar system. Earth here is in blue going and uh, hopefully the animation will reset and it hits the end. Um, and um, all these fluffy white dots are dust particles. I guess I have to click it again. So here comes Earth in the blue. And uh, the date is actually changing in the upper bit. But we cross this path on the, through December 11, 12, 13. And, and so um, these dust particles orbit in a ellipse, an egg-shaped orbit. And they're in the same, they orbit in the same path um, year after year after year. And it's only when Earth passes through that stream that we see it. So uh, a few days here we are in late November. Uh, we don't get to see any of these meteors at all, but uh, we get to see a few in the nights leading up. And then when we go through the main um, path, that's when we uh, get our meteor. So what is a meteor? Also commonly called shooting stars. Um, they uh, uh, hopefully, uh, oh, sorry, a really slow meteor when it crosses the sky. Uh, it uh, takes a couple of seconds, but most meteors, uh, when we see them, they flash in under a second. So if you can actually point out a meteor to somebody and get them to turn around and see it, ah, that won't be a meteor. That'll just be a satellite that's traveling slowly. Meteors are literally this, and it's gone. Uh, they, the, uh, your friends have to be looking in the same direction to be able to uh, see it. Um, and um, if um, it's uh, it taken a little while, but about two to three hundred years ago, astronomers figured out that uh, the Earth orbits the sun at an astounding 30 kilometers per second, not per hour, not per minute, but per second. And that's a, a very um, uh, uh, difficult speed to grasp. Imagine if you could travel to Calgary at 30 kilometers a second. It would we, we get there really fast. Um, but um, if you've ever hand pumped a bicycle wheel or a soccer ball and you felt the heat that you generate where the air goes out of the pump and into the needle, that uh, segment of the pump gets uh, quite hot. And that's actually not friction that's heating it up, but just the compression. If you compress air, it gets hotter. And so you're pumping at a rate of about three meters per second, and you're generating all that heat. If you could pump air at uh, 30 kilometers per second, 
well, now you know why things burn up. It would just explode into flames. And that's exactly what happens to this dust when the earth cuts through this uh, stream of dust at 30 uh, kilometers a second. Now, of course, the meteors themselves are moving. So you can add up uh, sometimes the, the, they go together and, and the meteors catch up to the earth. Sometimes they're like this, they're broadside and sometimes they're head on. But the, the uh, faster we uh, slam into the meteors, the, the brighter the meteors get. And, and this was, knowledge was uh, pieced together with careful observation and experimentation. And scientists actually eventually figured out that the meteors, um, uh, that this dust comes from comet tails and the remains of solar system formation. And when uh, we see a, a, a fireball, the ones that really catch the news where the sky literally does light up, uh, the, uh, and, and astronomers trace those back, typically they'll end up out here uh, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter from the asteroid belt. And those fireballs are typically chunks of rock, whereas uh, we know comets, uh, uh, comet dust to be the size and mass of a grain of sand, a grain of salt, and they will burn uh, up in our atmosphere as brightly as some of the uh, brightest uh, stars that we see in the sky. So um, now the, the key words that are often associated with meteors are something called irradiant. And uh, that's because the meteors appear to radiate away from a spot on the sky. Like if you see a meteor here and you sort of traced it back, where would it come from? And you see a meteor going across the sky up here. Where would, if you traced it back, it would all appear to come from a point. Uh, and this um, is all just a trickery of perspective, because uh, if you think of railway tracks, how uh, as they go off towards uh, the, the deep distance, they appear to converge at a point, even though we all know railway tracks never join up. We'd have a significant problem with our transportation if railway tracks actually met. Uh, but uh, th so this uh, vanishing point is in, in the art world is where parallel lines, so things moving in parallel, appear to come out of a single point. So that's why we call it the radiant. And the other thing uh, that will now hopefully make a bit more sense is that if you're looking close to the radiant, meteors will be short. And if you're looking farther away from the radiant, the meteors will be longer. And if you look at the fence line here, if it's closer to you, more sideways, it looks like a very long meteor, but closer to the radiant, it looks really short, even though it's actually a, just about the same uh, length. And similarly, these uh, telephone poles, we all know that telephone poles are exactly the same height, but in the distance, they appear shorter. So, where is the best place to look when you're out there looking for meteors? It's basically look up uh, away from the ground because you're not going to see any meteors down on the ground. You're not going to see any meteors uh, through the trees. Uh, well, sometimes you can if they're, they're bright, but um, the, uh, the, the more sky you have, the better your chance of seeing a meteor. Now, the uh, Geminids are known um, for their peak rate of 120 per hour, so more than one a minute. But that's when the radiant is overhead, which is a little bit after midnight, and also when there's no moon in the sky. Now, on December the 13th, uh, 14th, uh, that night, you'll have a gibbous or fairly, f not quite full moon. So there'll be a fair bit of light in the sky, but thankfully uh, the gibbous moon is never as bright as the full moon. So still being out under the country, 
uh, the rates will be halved. So maybe uh, 50 to 60 per hour, uh, depending on, on um, the, the conditions. If there's, if there's a little bit of a cirrusy cloud, uh, probably a little bit less than that. But um, it turns out the geminids, instead of being dust, they're more like grains of sand. They're, they're made of um, stiffer material. And so they burn more brightly. And here's a, uh, a classic uh, bright geminid meteor. There's the wonderful constellation of Orion, Betelgeuse, and the Orion Nebula, just this fuzzy patch there. The three bright stars of the belt pointing down to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, almost buried behind this uh, wonderful geminid meteor. But if you actually sort of trace this line, back it'll be it'll end up up here somewhere which is in the constellation of gemini and so you go aha i do know that this is a geminid meteor because it's not coming from a different direction so when is the best time uh, to look at it so the peak the actual bright peak will be the monday night december 13th 14th now, of course, Monday night is a working night, as is Sunday night. So can we get away with seeing the meteors on uh, before uh, that? And the answer is yes. Now, the interesting thing, like this is a, um, a, a, a graph of the meteor activity, how many meteors per hour, 20 per hour is this. So down here is five, six. And as we get... Uh, closer to the stream, we get more meteors and they start picking up. And now the, the interesting thing, just like that uh, uh, animation I was showing earlier, you get bits and bits and bits and then it rises up and it's very sharp drop off after. So uh, when, when we go to look for the Geminids um, and we say, oh, well, Monday night might be cloudy could be good Sunday night, could be good Tuesday night. It's pick the nights before the maximum because the rates are actually much higher than the night after the maximum. They drop right down very quickly. Um, so uh, if you're going to err on the side of caution, uh, what uh, uh, Bruce McCurdy, uh, my erstwhile meteor observing companion, likes to say the contingency observation if you're going to make sure you don't miss anything it's better to check it out the nights leading up to uh, the meteors but um, if uh, if conditions are wonderful and they sometimes are i'll probably be out on both nights uh, watching the meteors it's it's just um, fabulous to do this but so even if uh, um, you're uh, constrained to uh, only being able to go out uh, Saturday night. Um, it's still going to be quite worthwhile. We're uh, talking uh, 30 meteors per hour. Now we have to drop that down due to the moonlight. Uh, so maybe um, 15 meteors per hour. But again, if you're in the city, then you've probably got to drop that down to about five per hour. So it really makes a difference being uh, out. In the, uh, the country sky stuff, but Saturday night is uh, certainly a good night. Um, if uh, that's all you can do, then give it a whirl. And uh, here is a a video. Uh, the view is uh, a bit um, jittery, but the audio is from uh, a meteor shower and gives you a taste of what observing in a group. There is no way there. I can see it. Good, good. Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> oh, Ooh, there's one. Okay. Oh. Can you press stop on that? And wait till I can explode. Oh. oh, that Aurora's kicking way up. Huh. Oh, oh, there was a big one just off that oh, way. Three, three. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. oh, there's, oh, there's one. one. Yeah. Oh. oh. What, what are the other showers? Oh, yeah, that nice that's one. in my frame. There we go. That Where's was a bright frame? one. Yeah. Where that was like a very good look. Oh, oh, that was a nice now one. Where the hell are you guys looking? That was off to the side. Sorry, is Alpha Cap 
the one on the left or the one on the right? Yeah, it's on the left. So that, that's uh, a compressed audio. We don't get to see that many meteors that quick on the heels, uh, one on the heels of the other. Uh, but um, hopefully that's given you a bit of a taste of uh, why uh, we like um, going out as a group, uh, not only is it safer for everybody, um, but uh, it, it's just uh, you get uh, that, that sort of sense of community and uh, uh, that extra little jolt of uh, joy when uh, 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 three or four people see, see the same bright media. Tucked in there was uh, Ross Sinclair uh, remarking after two or three people go, wow, just where are you guys looking? I didn't see that. Uh, so that, that's uh, always uh, a bit of fun uh, when um, when we're watching meteors. We, we typically uh, spread out a little bit uh, and uh, we face we have our set our chairs facing each other and uh, we look at the sky. So not everybody sees quite the same bit of the sky, and uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun uh, to observe uh, meteors in a group. Um, a key 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 thing about um, meteor observing is you have to dress for it. And by that, I mean, um, if the nighttime minimum is minus 10, you have to dress like it's minus 30 because you're effectively, it's like standing at a bus stop for three hours waiting for that bus that just isn't coming uh, because you're not moving. Uh, so you need to be really, really o completely overdressed in order to be just right. And then uh, finally, um, we've got, uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, a really nice comet uh, coming in uh, to the inner solar system um, in the uh, middle of December. It starts um, basically uh, December 9th. Uh, some pictures are already showing up on the internet, of course, uh, but uh, to, we should be able to see this in binoculars from the country. And with any luck, it'll be as good as Neowise was a couple of uh, summers ago. Here's a picture I took of Comet Neowise over downtown. It's this elongated sword of, of light uh, in the evening sky. So hopefully it's as bright as this. But comets are, uh, to quote uh, Canadian uh, David Levy, discovered more than 25 comets. Um, he says, comets are like cats. They have tails and they do whatever they want. And uh, that's um, really true. Um, there's so many unknowns about comets as to um, not only how big or small they are, because the bigger they are, the more surface area they are, the more uh, sun they can absorb and heat up and release the dust. A comet is basically a dirty snowball, uh, ice and dust uh, with, uh, with some pebbles and, and dirt in there. And um, wh when it comes uh, close to the sun and heats up, it may be uh, like a snowball, uh, very loosely packed together. So um, when, when it gets close, it just goes and dissolves into nothing. And other ones will be so compact um, and they, they will hardly release anything at all. And what makes a comet bright is how much dust it uh, puts out. And so there's so many unknowns that um, this comet could either be, uh, it could fizzle and be a dud, or it could be even better than this. Uh, and the, the short answer is we just don't know. And even two or three days ahead, uh, you could say, oh, well, uh, you know, reports from uh, uh, Arizona say it's, it's just a, a, a weak average comet. And then two nights later, the comet could actually literally crack in half or into 20 pieces, as we've uh, sometimes seen comets do. And suddenly all that surface area is now available. The dust just goes all over the place and the comet brightens by more than a factor of a thousand in two days. So you, you sort of, you can't even, um, 
go by news reports because, well, that was last night. You don't know what tonight is going to look like. So with that, um, where do we look? So it's uh, near where the sun is. And at dawn, uh, just in the days um, before, it's nicely in the sky, uh, kind of like it is in this picture here, fairly high up. Uh, 30 degrees is one third of the way up the sky. And it, it comes down pretty fast to um, just uh, seven degrees, which is smaller than the bowl of the Big Dipper is five degrees. Uh, no, pardon me, it's 10, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, but it's, it's not much as it comes down. Now that's in the morning at, at dawn, which um, at this time of year is 7.15. So binoculars, again, are the, the best tool to look at. Now in the evening sky, this is where this chart at the bottom comes in. Evening is a weird word to use in December because it's really dusk, 5.30, uh, before supper time as uh, in, in the average uh, person has <laughs> supper at 6 p.m. or later. Um, so it's uh, almost before supper time. It's, uh, it stays very low through its... Uh, um, as it passes by the sun, this is the sun here. Down below, the blue line is the horizon. And so it just cruises up, uh, in the southwest, but you just need to look above where the sun is and scan uh, with your binoculars. But uh, the 13th, 14th, it'll be uh, right uh, straight above the sun. And then Venus is the blazing light here. So um, that's a, a, your sort of your homework for the next few days uh, or evenings is um, about uh, uh, as we get towards 530, look for Venus. It looks like that plane that's coming into land. Um, and the comet will be no higher in the evening sky than Venus. It's always going to be lower than Venus. So you're going to need a good horizon. Your um, your average sort of suburban um, neighborhood is going to have too many trees, too many houses. You'll have to uh, walk out to, uh, say, a schoolyard park uh, where the soccer field is. So you've got a nice long zone where there's no trees or houses in the way to, to have a look at this thing. Coming up. And of course, uh, uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page or our email list for chatter uh, for those uh, uh, of us who've um, seen it before. And um, the the real important thing here <laughs> is uh, don't wait. Um, because if you go, oh, I'll, I'll just wait till six o'clock. Well, it's going to be then uh, setting and it'll be only two degrees above the horizon. And uh, the more atmosphere you look through, the duller a comet or anything will get uh, to the point where you won't see it. So uh, uh, 5.30 is really the, the sort of the key time, plus or minus five minutes, not uh, not much more than that uh, when that'll be at its best. Any earlier, the sky is going to be lighter because the sun will be uh, higher up. And any later, uh, well, it'll upset. So that'll be uh, the, the thing to look for. So keep, um, keep an eye on our, our Facebook page for uh, any kind of information. But uh, basically, don't wait. Give it a try yourself each time because it is it is very possible for the comet to break apart, flare, and the next night it's dissolved and almost gone. Uh, before you know it. So, um, yeah, don't, don't wait a week. <laughs> so don't keep putting it off. Um, so this is a, a shot from the uh, free um, planetarium software called Stellarium. It's Stella, Arium at the end of it. Uh, so looking southwest, there's Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, and the comet will be, excuse me, down here in the glow. And hopefully it'll be much brighter than what this um, prediction has. 
uh, and uh, we'll get a fantastic comment. Or maybe not at all. So <laughs> we will see. Uh, but um, yeah, these things uh, we get um, on average about one really nice comment about every uh, 10 to 15 years. Some decades they get two or three, and then some decades they get none. So you just don't know. Just because we got a nice comment two years ago um, is completely irrelevant whether this one is going to be nice or not. So the only way to know is to actually go out there and look. So um, that um, is uh, the, uh, here we come to the end of uh, tonight's uh, talk for introduction to stargazing in the universe. And uh, by all means, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, um, unmute yourself and uh, ask away, and I'll put us back into the chat And I would like to comment that the, you could also ask questions in the chat if you feel more comfortable that way. And then, uh, uh, not not to dissuade you at all from looking at this comment. Uh, there's uh, hopefully yet another nice comment in May, um, but again, we, uh, we just cannot tell whether it's going to be fantastic or not. Alistair, I thought meteors were dust coming off of comets, but that picture you showed there earlier with the looked like a meteor going right across past Earth and past the sun and going out forever. I'm confused about that. I, I don't understand. It, it's it's a swarm of dust. Uh, and so um, the uh, um, there's thousands upon thousands of dust particles that the the uh, the comet releases as this as the snow evaporates off the comet it releases the dust and it sort of spreads out into thousands upon thousands if not millions of, of dust particles and they spread out along the the comet's orbit and so uh, we will as as the as the earth punches through that swarm we only get to see a few of them. So that picture you showed, um, that was a comet that went through years ago because we passed through the, the dust every year? That's right, yes. Oh. Um, and in so, for example, um, Comet Halley has two meteor showers associated with it. One of them is called the Eta Aquarids in spring, and the other is the Orionids in October. Uh, it just so happens that the, the path that how his comet comes through is the Earth punches through it uh, twice. Um, for the Gemini meteor shower, the, uh, the, that elliptical path is tilted enough. We only punch through one of them, and the other one we, we miss totally. Um, and in this case, the Geminids, the unusual thing is the parent comet is actually not a comet but an asteroid so it's one of the um uh i guess um uh, uh standouts or uh, oddballs where okay the parent comet is an asteroid well wait a minute <laughs> uh and and so it's one of these funny objects that uh is this sort of hybrid between it's not a comet and obviously it's an asteroid that's spitting out lots and lots of dust, which asteroids don't do. So, um, but uh, we we get the the result that the uh, this asteroid spitting off a lot of dust puts out um, harder, grainier um, uh, dust, and so uh, they make for brighter meteors. Thank you very much. 
Uh, thanks very much for the talk. I, I just had a question uh, about general observing in the winter time. Um, I know that you're supposed to let the telescope cool down outside to sort of equilibrate and get a better view. Do you need to do the same thing with binoculars um, when you take them outside? Short answer, no. Um, the uh, the what um, essentially what you're um, describing is that the uh, the heat coming off of well everything, including yourself, uh, um, basically causes ripples in the atmosphere, which blurs things. And it's just with a telescope, you're magnifying 50, 80, 150 times, whereas with binoculars, you're only magnifying seven six seven eight times and so that same turbulence is there in both cases but with the binoculars the turbulence is small enough that you basically you don't see it but with the uh, telescope um yeah you'll, you'll see just all these waves especially if you look at the moon you just sort of see these waves going by um, but um, most telescopes will cool down uh, the uh, the smaller ones that are about um, 10 centimeters um, or less they'll cool down in 15 20 minutes uh, the the bigger uh, ones 20 centimeters eight inch they'll be closer to 30 minutes for cooling down and and again it's because you're putting way more magnification and so you're magnifying the turbulence, which is why it's a problem for telescopes and not for binoculars. Gotcha. Thanks very much. And is there a sort of a minimum temperature? I know it's it's uncomfortable to be out for a long time, but for a telescope or binoculars, like once it gets past minus 15, minus 20, is that uh, is just the thermal contraction? Is that going to do any uh, damage or anything? Usually it does not, um, well, I have never heard of, actually it's not quite true, I think I've only heard of one time when it's actually done damage to uh, optics, but uh, basically, yeah, metal contracts down, um, but um, uh, generally the, uh, the optics are okay. Uh, what ends up happening is the, uh, the when you're the foc it's the focuser is the big problem because um, it's uh, typically it's got teeth engaged in, in in metal and as you rotate the focuser you're trying to move it and this thing has grease in it and most instruments have grease that does not do well at minus 20 or colder and so it ends up just gelling and freezing and if you're um, yeah, well, anxious or cold and tired, you go and you twist it and you'll actually snap the thing. So, uh, yes, they're, they're um, uh, for an average uh, uh, piece of equipment, minus 20 is usually the, the sort of the threshold. I've, I've never had any issues um, warmer than minus 20. Uh, but once you get below minus 20, unless you've got, as some of our uh, folks in the club do, they've got uh, low temperature grease. They've you know, got, got friends uh, who've, uh, who worked at Fort McMurray and go, oh, yeah, you need to <laughs> take your stuff apart, pack it with grease that is okay to work in, in Fort Mac in the winter and you'll be okay. But then at, at that point as well, um, minus 20 is about, um it starts to be about my personal limit i'll i'll observe um uh, meteor showers at minus 20 um let the, the cameras go because the cameras actually generate their own internal heat uh, so that's okay uh, but yeah the equipment starts misbehaving and most people just don't have the the, the gear to withstand more than um uh, a couple of hours at minus 20. So if you want to, like if um, if you were observing from Fort Mac um, and intent on doing it, it's, yeah, uh, just stock up, do the right thing with the, the uh, grease up the equipment properly, get the, the right gear. Uh, but otherwise, um, 
yeah, um, yeah I think uh, we had a few of us observing the total eclipse of the moon a, a couple of three years ago. It was about minus 30 and it's just like, oh boy, that was, that was tough. Because of course you're trying to, you know, oh, I need to change the eyepiece, but you can't use your mitts. So you've got maybe perhaps gloves with the, the, the fingertips exposed. And at minus 30, holy smokes, it's, it's fast where you're touching metal and it's just, yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it then becomes just like, um, it's not pleasant. It's not fun anymore. Uh, so for mm -hmm. special things like an eclipse, yeah, I go to minus 30 for an eclipse. Um, minus 20, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll really only do meteor observing. Um, uh, and then minus 15, it's, it's just starting to uh, get there. <laughs> I, I, if, if I might say here, um, so I know Alistair has a way of observing, which in, normally in, in, involves driving away from the city and spending a good chunk of at least three or four hours outside uh, observing. I do things a little bit differently. I don't drive. So I actually observe from the city. So what I try to do, I have my telescope and all my gear in my garage. So, you know, it's cold already when I get it out. So my observing sessions are maybe a little bit more often than Alistair, but never more than one hour or one hour and a half. So I normally in a night scan two or three objects in the sky. I sketch them, I observe them, and then I pack and go to bed because I also have to get up early in the morning. So for me, I can go a little bit colder because I don't stay that long anyway, and I am at home. So when I call, I just pack and go. So, so that's, you know, that's another way of maybe I don't get to see the beautiful sky that Alistair sees when he goes and drives out of the city, but I still have a lot of beautiful things that you can see from the city. And, uh, and if you don't make your observing sessions that long, uh, you can actually go when it's cold and the equipment that's fine because after one hour and a half, you, I still, my focus set still works fine. I never had any problem. I mean, I don't think I will go out at minus 35 but I certainly been out minus 20, you know, with all my ski pants and all my gear. If it's only one hour or one hour and a half, you're fine. Yeah, that's... Yeah. You, you just have to be really um, strict with how you breathe. <laughs> it's just like you come up to the eyepiece, it's... <gasps> to make sure you don't it's fog the eyepiece. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Thanks very much. I really enjoyed the, the talk. This yeah. is my first time attending one of these. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. And, and um, as a, um, a, a complete opposite, uh, one of my good friends, uh, he um, enjoyed variable stars. And one of the things uh, with variable stars, the, the crispness of the image is not required. You're just looking at the brightness of a variable star compared to some what we call comparison stars and judging the difference. And so what he did, he used a small telescope, just literally 70 millimeter uh, objective. So, uh, so uh, two, uh, two and a half inches, give or take. Um, and he was inside looking through a triple pane window. And yeah, it's, it's slightly blurry, but well, for variable stars, it's okay. And hey, I, you know, he's observing in shorts, <laughs> but um, limited space. He can't look at what's you know out that way or out that way. He just, but it was the hey, this is what I'm doing for, you know, you know whatever one hour. I can just lay down uh, in, in my living room, turn out all the lights, and uh, look through the window. But you'll never get good views of the planets that way. <laughs> It, that only worked for variable stars, but it, it's just sort of an example of um, it's actually fairly straightforward to find something that matches uh, your lifestyle and and what you can uh, do with your time. And you just have to make sure you're 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 not trying anything extreme if you're <laughs> in the city or. Or, or looking through the window, but but the big thing is uh, never open the window and look out through it because then the heat going out of your house, the turbulence will be just completely awful.
Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there any question? If uh, anyone wants to type it in the chat, oh, otherwise, please. December, uh, Alistair, you want to mention? Oh, uh, thank yeah. you. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the our uh, if you go by calendar, our next slot is December 22nd, and since that's pretty close to Christmas and all that, uh, we are not going to uh, have a session uh, in December, but we'll see you later in January. And uh, But uh, uh, our uh, other person here, Jeff Robertson, who does uh, one week from tonight, will be doing What's Up in the Sky? in Edmonton, so he'll be covering a little bit of overlap of what we've done tonight, but uh, some other things, and as well, uh, classic uh, moments from space history, which I always enjoy. Uh, so uh, uh, by all means, uh, uh, please uh, come again a week from now and check out uh, what Jeff is doing. And uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, the, the best thing to do is, you know, even without binoculars, is just any time the sky is clear, just walk outside for five minutes and look up, identify your stars, and and uh, it, it'll it'll just slowly get into you. So uh, with that, everyone uh, have a good rest of your evening, and uh, we will see you in in, in two months. Yeah, and we'll see Jeff next week. Okay, have a good Thanks, night. Good night. Thanks, 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 Bye. Thanks, Bye. See you all.